This thing is like really zoomed out. Um, yep, okay, we're live. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome into the Kansas City Baseball Vault. I am Troy Olson. I'm joined by Michael Engel, who's all over my screen for some reason. Let me see if I can change <laughs> that. I'm all up in uh, your business. You're all up in my business. I don't know. I don't know why it's not switching again, but this could be fun. Hopefully, it's switching for everybody else now, as I'm controlling it and not just me. But if not, it is what it is. Maybe we'll just get an hour of Michael Engel because it's the Michael Engel show. It might be because I've set it up on a separate computer for the recording. So. Um, we're all just uh, we're all just participants this week, but anyways, if you're if you're wondering what we're talking about, we of course do this live um, different times every week. It, it seems uh, today it's it's Saturday, 2 p.m. 10:27, uh, 2012. Uh, like I said, this is Kansas City Baseball Vault. I'm Troy Olson. We're live at at YouTube.com/slash Royal Man Report, and uh, and I'm joined by Michael Engel, as we said, and of course Jeff Herr is back with us this week. Jeff, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic. How are you guys doing? I'm doing well. Um, uh, Michael was apparently doing better until about five minutes ago. What's the <laughs> score in that KU Texas game, Mike? Uh, it is 21 to seven, and there are three seconds left. Oh, and uh, Texas is winning. I take it. Yeah, they just took the lead uh, with about 12 seconds left. So I thought I thought KU was up 14-7 in that game at one point. They were, and then they gave up uh, a touchdown, and then they, they went on a really good drive. It was like a seven-minute drive, and they got a field goal out of it. Oh, well, I thought and you said it was 21-7. What was the score? 21-17. 21-17. I apologize. I didn't uh, there's there, three I seconds left. We'll see if uh, – yeah. Uh, anyway, it's KU it football. Would, you don't expect would, to win, but when you get the opportunity, you, know, you, you want to finish it off, and they did not do that. So. You know, I, I, I get offered free tickets to these games, and this is one I absolutely passed on because I was like, there's just no way I'm going to go watch KU get stomped by Texas because I hate Texas so very, very much. Oh, well. But let's save all that for later. Um, because Jeff and I are going to do a real quick um, – I think we're going to try to do a quick uh, ESR later today, Echo Sports Report. Uh, we'll see uh, how much of that we get done. But let's get going with the Kansas City Baseball Vault. we got we got a big show for you today. The live portion is not going to be that big, so if you are watching at YouTube at youtube.com slash royalmanreport, make sure you take the time to head on over to kingsofhoffman.com slash podcast and download um, the, uh, the latest episode because we're going to have a couple of great interviews today with Ryan Verdugo and Jason Adam. I pre-recorded these earlier this week, and uh, I love talking to Jason Adam and Ryan Verdugo. They are two of my absolute favorites. So uh, We'll talk a little bit about those interviews coming up. The guys have had a chance to listen to them, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about those. We're also going to wrap up our, uh, our final week of the Out of the Park experiment. I've actually started on the second experiment that I wanted to do because the first one didn't turn out too well for me. But head on over to ootpdevelopments.com. Uh, before the World Series ends, so if if the Giants sweep, then you don't have much longer. But um, you head on over there and and pick up the game for just twenty dollars until the end of the World Series. Uh, additionally, one more housekeeping note: November eighteenth, I believe it's a Sunday. We're going to try to do a Chiefs watch party slash tweet up at Kelly's Westport Inn. So listen and and watch your favorite Twitter accounts for uh, for upcoming information on that. And I think with that, we'll actually get started here. Um, the Royals hired a new hitting coach, and I guess that's where we'll start today. I don't know that it's big news because it definitely wasn't a big name. The, no. the, biggest, the biggest thing this guy has done, and, and Bob Fesco was having a lot of fun with this, but Jack Maloof owned, uh, wrote a book on hitting. Mm-hmm. And in his book, he talks about hitting home runs a lot, and you know that that was something that the Royals wanted. So, Mike, you be you and Jeff are definitely more of our uh, our our stats and the, and kind of baseball geeks. I'm more of the fan and, and host, and that's how this show's always worked. So, why don't you two take away what we're going to take away from um, Andre David and Kevin Maloof, or I think I said his name wrong, didn't I? Jack Maloof. Jack yeah. Maloof, um, <laughs> taking over for Kevin Seitzer as hitting coach. Mike. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, they've both been. <laughs> They've both been in the Royals organization for a while. Uh, Andre David was actually the Royals hitting coach um, 
from I think it was May 2005 until May 2006, which is a great time to be a Royals fan uh, as well. So, uh, you know, I, they've both been kind of in the organization. Um, yeah, Maloof does have that book, and he's got a website of, about, I think it's just jackmaloof.com, and it's about hitting instruction. Um, you know, I, they're not big names, but I, I think sometimes that's okay. I don't know in this case one way or the other. Um, I, I can't really speak a lot to what they've done because it, it's hard to tell, you know, up and down an organization what they've all done. But their their guys, uh, Maloof especially, was a guy who walked a lot in the minor leagues, and you know you hope that will translate over. The problem with that is Kevin Seitzer walked a lot in the minor leagues and the major leagues, and it didn't really. You know, that message never got across. So maybe Maloof's a better instructor in that sense. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, sometimes the coaches, they don't make that big of a difference. Uh, I think Seitzer probably did help guys like Alex Gordon uh, at least get a program that they could then take over. But I think a, mo a lot of that turnaround is Gordon's. Um, but if you look at guys like Jeff Francoeur, who he gets some credit for for his 2011 season, well, if he gets the credit for that, he has to get some of the blame for his poor 2012 as well. So, you know, it's always kind of this game of, of w what you attribute to the coach. So is it a big move? I don't know. But I think it's interesting that they went with – uh, Maloof is the, the major league hitting coach, and then Andre David is going to be the assistant. So they're both going to be at the big league level, which is a, a difference from what they've done in the past. And that's kind of a trend in the big leagues now where, you, where you'll have more than one hitting coach. Um, so uh, it's also interesting to me, and I don't know if this has anything to do with it at all or not, but they're both left-handed hitters. And you look last year at the guys who struggled, the guys like Moustakis and Eric Hosmer, both left-handed hitters. So I, I'm curious if there's something um, with Seitzer where he wasn't able to maybe communicate uh, the same things as well with those two last year. I, I don't know. I, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, they did want to go towards more of a home run hitting approach. That's what they said in the postseason press conference, um, the idea of pulling the ball more. So, uh, you know, that's kind of what they're seeing, and they're kind of installing these new guys, and uh, I, that's probably going to be the, the lesson that they teach. You know, I, I first of all, I want to agree with your first point you made, where the, they're not huge names, and that's not necessarily a problem. Yeah. Um, I think usually when that's either not a problem or a good thing is when, you know, someone is not a... Um, someone's not a big name because they're not really known yet, but they're mm -hmm. the team, you know, by hiring them, whoever that team may be, may be kind of a little bit trying to be ahead of the curve at some point. And that just doesn't seem to be the case, though, unfortunately, in this situation. Because for me the right now, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for me right now, I, I am... The Royals are guilty until proven innocent with any move that they make. Be just because of the nature of, of, of their organization over the last 20 years and the moves that they've made. And when you look at Dayton Moore and what he's done, and to see when you have a chance like this to kind of do something different, maybe shake things up, and he makes an internal hire from the organization, mm -hmm. similar to you know Rick Knapp's whatever happened with that whole scenario and then bringing Bill Fisher back into the fold and then promoting a guy, I can never remember that guy's name. Steve Foster. Yeah, who's going to be the new minor league pitching coordinator. Yeah. He was an internal guy as well. So, yep. you know, the, the biggest problem with Dayton Moore has been surrounding himself with all of his guys and his yes men, people that don't mm -hmm. challenge him, that, that refuse to think outside the box. So seeing another situation where he has an opportunity – to make things different, to make a better change, and he just does another internal hire of just one of his guys that are going to yep. do whatever he wants to say. You know, it, it ultimately, it's just, it keeps, just continually, continues to pound that frustration of the Royals just refusing to think outside the box. And I can't, I can't get excited about it, and I don't think anybody's really excited about it either way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for me, it's just another thing of, you know, I, I don't want you – know, I'd rather the Royals did something a little bit different and 
the, this whole idea of uh, we want to hit more home runs, you know, walks and home runs now all of a sudden is their approach as opposed to apparently contact, which was more their approach the last few years, I guess, you know, even though they don't really make it clear, I guess, but they're trying mm-hmm. to make it clear now home runs is what we want to do, and, and they want to focus a little bit more on walks, I think, just to get people on base. So when they hit a home run, it's a three-run homer instead of a of a solo homer, which, I mean, you know, no, I guess that's good logic, but... Um, it, 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 to me, it just continues to, to strike of the, the royals of an organization that says, hey, you know what? We want to ascribe to a certain philosophy, and we want to force everyone to fit to that. Whoever mm-hmm. we go out and get, whatever their skill set is, we can change them to do what we want to do. You know, Alex Gordon is the perfect example. The royals have never played to his skill set until they finally – you know, last year and the majority of this year said, you know what, bat lead off, that's when you're doing the best. And then even then, he has this just ridiculous amounts of success, and they say, you know what, you're having success now, now we're going to try and force you to, as that square peg that you've become, we're going to try and force you into yeah. this round hole as a number three hitter. And now you're a run producer. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's just, I want an organization to, you know, this is to bring in a different a different example, look at like uh, what Bill Self does with KU. I mean, the reason he makes – he is such a great coach. And I'm not trying to compare basketball to baseball at all. I'm simply from a philosophical standpoint. You look mm-hmm. at Bill Self and you see him as somebody who, no matter who his players are, like he has his system, but he makes tweaks and changes to that system mm-hmm. to fit the personnel that he has. He doesn't say, hey, Jeff Withy, you have to be Cole Aldrich. You know, he doesn't say you have to be Thomas Robinson. He's going to say, Jeff Withy, you're going to do what you're going to do, and then we're going to change the offense to, you know, play to your strengths and cover up your weaknesses. Whereas the mm-hmm. Royals aren't that organization. They say, we want to hit home runs. So, Alex Gordon, you need to start hitting home runs. I don't care if you bat 250 next year. You need to hit 25 home runs. You know, Billy Butler, yeah, you hit 313, and your on base was 365 or whatever it was. That's great, but... You know, let's hit – I want you to hit five more home runs and drop your batting average 30 points. You know, it, it's – it's that's what's the most frustrating to me about this whole thing, the Royals wanting to hit more home runs and, and that trying to be the, the approach to having with the hitting coach. So, ultimately, for me, I'm not excited about it. And quite frankly, I think it's just another another way for the Royals to, to – without being, you know, too negative, to, to screw something up. <laughs> Well, and Jack Maloof was in the Braves organization from 2002 to 2007 as well. So it's just more of the same. I mean, you're not bringing any new ideas in. You're bringing the same ones. You're just putting them in different spots. It's just really a weird approach. And uh, there's no way you can say that what the Royals have done has worked aside from the draft. And we still haven't really seen that turn into what you want it to be, which are wins at the major league level. So... I don't know. I, we'll see. I'm will, I'm open-minded to see what happens, but uh, my expectations are pretty uh, – they're tempered, I'll say. Well, and I think my big thing, and this is kind of off of what Jeff said, um, is it uh, It concerns me that, um, that they're so bent on home runs because home runs, in a way, do lead to, um, to strikeouts. Mm-hmm. And – and I think that's what they're going to be complaining about next year. And, and they had said this on 610. So while this is my original thought as well, it, it has already been said. And I, I don't want to take anything away from uh, people in mass media that have said the same thing that I'm echoing, which is, you know, anytime you go for more home runs, you're uh, you're going to – it's going to lead to more strikeouts because you're, you're trying to hit the ball so much harder. Mm-hmm. You're not making contact anymore. You're trying to kill the ball. Uh, quick question. On it's the like Will Myers did that too. Yeah. In Omaha, he struck out a lot more, but he also hit 37 homers. Among like two the one home run hitters, that guarantees yeah. that Will Myers is up next year, right? And even even with that, too. Um, I mean, and I think I guess the ultimate hope is that, you know, even if – take someone like Adam Dunn and he's an extreme example, mm-hmm. but – your ultimate hope is that if you're going to hit more home runs, that you actually do, first of all. But um, if you're going to strike out more, that you walk more, too. Because mm-hmm. you look at Will Myers. He hit a ton of home runs last year for a minor leaguer. He struck out quite a bit. 
But the thing that nobody really talks about, you know, I know Rainey's hit on this on his website a lot, and you see people, some people talk about, but the general public doesn't really hear about, is that, you know, Will Myers walked last season alone twice as much as Mike Moustakis ever walked in any season in the minors last year. You know, and that was the last time I looked at it. So, I mean, I, I, it wasn't the end of the season, so it might have even been even more than that. But, you know, point is, he walked, he walked a real, real good amount, too. And so I guess if there's a bright side of me, I think there's that you maybe kind of make up for that less contact with hopefully being more selective and having a better approach at the plate. But based on the Royals over the last 20 years, I absolutely think that that's not going to happen, <laughs> to be honest. Well, um, a quick uh, technical note. Guys, when you're listening, is it really choppy? No. Not to me. No. Okay, it must just be on my end, which is awesome because it means it's recording well. Um, I always get it. I'm still. We're we're always tweaking this, you know. So I always gotta, I always gotta see what's going on with it. Anyways, um, let's see. There was, there's one more thing that I had sent you guys, but I'm gonna throw you a little bit of a curveball. Something that Whoa. Bill Ivy pointed me to from I-70 Baseball. He pointed me to this at work the other day. Um, we work together. If people don't know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but there, there's ten experts that that put together the Fielding Bible Awards, yeah. and I was going to try to see you. You guys probably know better than I do who's all involved in this. But I think it's a. Uh, I know it's John Dewan and Bill James who we all missed a chance to listen to talk. Um, yeah, I this completely last forgot week. he was doing that. So I didn't forget, and honestly, I was available to go, and I just I just got tied up with some things. But that's neither here nor there. Check out the yeah. Kansas City. Um, Baseball Historical Society for great events like that. It would have cost you, I think, uh, five bucks to get in or a yearly membership of twenty-five bucks. You know, we love those guys. Without them, mm -hmm. we would have never had the uh, Kansas City Baseball Vault Radio Show. But, anyways, um, those guys uh, that do this this award are, are very well respected in the industry. Mm -hmm. And the original one that I can't find now, but it, it showed runners up as as well as winners uh, and players to note for the sake of this show is the third base winner was Adrian Beltre from Texas, but his runner-up was Mike Moustakis. Yep. And in left field, with no runner-up whatsoever, in yeah. other words, nobody in left field compares he to Alex him. Gordon. Yeah. Yeah, he well, was – I think it was like 28 run save or whatever metric they used to measure it, and Gordon was at like 28, and the next closest guy had like 12. Uh, so it wasn't even close. And, you know, I think watching that, that makes sense. Uh you look at what he's done the last two years, he's played as good a defense as I've seen on any Royals team since I've been watching. You know, and that includes, you know, Mark Redzelanek won a gold glove, and it includes, uh, you know, even LCD's Escobar and, and such. I mean, he doesn't make yeah. a lot of errors. He has great range. The arm, I mean, speaks for itself. And he's just got fantastic instincts out there. I mean, you can't say enough about Alex Gordon's defense uh, so yeah, I mean that doesn't surprise me at all that, that he won that award, and a lot of time it sets him up pretty well for another Gold Glove, I think. And I, I think I think I think so too. I think he's probably going to win a second Gold Glove, and you know Gold Gloves don't necessarily mean as much as they used to, especially now in the outfield since they've switched mm -hmm. them to giving one for each legitimate position. But yeah. um, to your point, though, I mean a couple things about Alex Gordon switching. Number one being, um, I think it's awesome that. It'll be fun that if, if and when I have kids someday and Alex Gordon, you know, assuming he st say he stays a Royal for the rest of his career, which is a good possibility at this point, um, you know, say he does that and goes down as one of the best Royals ever, you know, it'll be, it'll be interesting to, to see someone's reaction when you say, oh, yeah, Alex Gordon was a third baseman for his first two years and then became one of the best left fielders in, in Royals history or whatever. And then uh, second thing, I can't think off the top of my head. I mean, when was the last time someone had like a position switch like this? And maybe it just seems like a bigger deal because Alex Gordon was supposed to be the next George Brett at third base, mm -hmm. both offensively and defensively. But I mean, when was the last time someone, not even just a Royal, had like a full skill position switch like this? Not you know left field to center field or something like that, and excelled as much as. As uh, as Gordon had, I mean, I can't it'd think be of like head, it'd but. be like Craig Biggio or Robin Yount or guys like that, where they're yeah, going I mean, from like Biggio's weird. I don't know if he won a Gold Glove or not, but he went from catcher to uh, center field to second, and Yount went from short to center. So, and uh, he, um, 
He was, was it? Didn't Pujols come up as like a right fielder or something? He was a third baseman when he was drafted. Third baseman, yeah. yeah. So I knew he wasn't a first baseman, and then he's won a couple of gold gloves there. But that's more yeah. based on his offensive production than than his defense. Even though he's he is pretty, pretty darn defense. good at defense, but he's yeah, a pretty I good think, defensive third baseman. Right? I think. I think if they didn't consider offense, Brendan Ryan would win the gold glove at shortstop every year. He has more range than I think anybody in all of baseball the last five years. He's ridiculous. So it's just weird. It's kind of it's kind of a popularity contest, but it still counts a little bit. I don't think it's they're just handing things out like he, Beltre definitely deserves a gold glove. Uh, you know, I think Mustakas has a strong case too, but I think Beltre absolutely deserves it. Uh, if he wins it at third base, um, Gordon I think deserves it. You know I think Brett Gardner deserved it last year too, um, and it just happens that all those guys have produced offensively too. Um, but I think sometimes with like Derek Jeter, I think you kind of get the benefit because he's got that that offense and it makes him more prominent as a player. Yeah, so. especially when you look at how well Alcides Escobar did last year. You know I think he kind of took a small step back. In 2012, mm -hmm. nothing huge, but he wasn't quite as sharp as he was, I think, in 2011. But, you know, I think when you look at, you know, him not winning in 2011, that's when it's like, eh. You know, maybe if he was batting 300 like he did this year, maybe he would have had a better shot. Who knows? Yeah. But, I don't know. It's a defensive award, but, yeah, I think offense factors in. It shouldn't. So, yeah, I checked, the, uh, I checked the YouTube, and it – I was going to say – what? I was gonna say I did. I'm, so I'm having all sorts of issues. My you guys are, are doing great. You sound great. Um, <laughs> I uh, I'm I'm not doing so well over here. My yeah, I should have I should have restarted my computer. Um, I uh, I was gonna say you know the thing about about playing in for a defensive award is is ridiculous. But Brandon Ryan did make that list on Fielding Bible as well um, at shortstop. And yeah, uh, as he I just I my question to you guys is every. We could say a majority of the fan base does not like Diff. What's that? Mm, nothing. No hey guys. Hello. Hello. Go ahead. Didn't say anything. Okay. Sorry. It's, <laughs> like I said, I'll have to fix this in post production. Um. Anyways. Uh, okay. Let's see if this is working here. Okay. Um. What I was trying to say, and hopefully this is working, is, um. If Jeff Gordon or Jeff Gordon, if Alex Gordon has a bad year the way that um, that Frank Gore has, will the fan base come against him like they have against Frank Gore because he's so good defensively, or can his defense rise above that? Well, I think it. I think it will help because it gives him another way to contribute. Part of the complaining against Frank Gore is, yeah, he was really bad at the plate, but he wasn't good in the field either. All he had was assists. And, you know, I wonder how many of those are balls that he might have been able to catch uh, that he ended up not getting to and still got the out on the throw. There might have been two or three of those or something. Uh, I think it gives him a chance to contribute. But I think it's also kind of a reputation thing. You could see Alex Gordon rebounding. Jeff Francoeur, he's got this pattern where he'll have a good year and then he has three or four really bad ones. And then kind of something rejuvenates him, he has a good, you know, four months, then he's bad again. And uh, 2011, he was really good. 2012, he was really bad. And uh, I, I think next year, I think we're still going to see a, a really bad Jeff Francoeur, you know, in the field and at the plate. Gordon, I think he could regress a little bit. We've kind of been talking about this for two years where his when he puts the ball in play it goes for a hit you know more often than the stats say it should and uh, that can that can turn around any time where instead of it falling for a hit you know now it's getting caught or now it's uh, in a position to be fielded so you know you could see some regression there but I think you know he's going to get on base enough to where it's not going to be a big deal if he doesn't you know, get a lot of hits or as many hits, and then the defense uh, is an improvement as well that you know kind of retains a lot of his value. Okay, and so then the last thing we need to talk about today, um, which is definitely more negative as far as as yeah. royal stuff is concerned, is the royal signed a pitcher. Everybody cheers, right? Yay! No, uh, yay! Yeah. It's yeah. because the Royals do what the Royals do. And I guess it was a good thing for me. I was 
too busy to really care yesterday, and I uh, I had to I had to get off of Twitter before I went into full rage mode. Um, but the the Royals signed a pitcher from the Cubs off of waivers, and it's nobody that you've you you're ever going to care about. And I'll just let Michael I'll let, actually we'll let Jeff Hur take it from there initially. I mean. This guy, I don't, I don't know, I don't know a ton about Chris Volstad, and I don't know. I mean, the if there's a bright spot, it's something that I think you can look and say. And I even heard someone ask this to Robert Ford, and he answered in the affirmative, which he normally never does. But they they asked, you know, does the signing of Volstad mean that? there's a higher likelihood that they could cut ties with Hoche over this offseason, and Robert Ford said yes. And usually on questions like those, Robert Ford doesn't give a, a typical straight answer. Um, he kind of toes the company line, which is understandable. But um, so, and, and I think that looking at that, I mean, I think that's a possibility. I think that definitely is a situation where with a guy like that who, I mean, honestly, the sad part is this guy is, is more or less a nobody. And I mean, just an average major league pitcher, maybe slightly below even. Mm-hmm. And he's still he's better than second, Hochaver. Yeah, he's got the second best ERA on our team right now from yeah. all the starters. You know, so I mean, that's more of an indictment on Royals pitching than it is on on this guy. But I think if it leads to cutting ties with Luke Hochaver, then I'm all for it. Absolutely. You know, and if if that's the case, then. Uh, you know, to me, I guess you could you could kind of see that as a good sign because it says, hey, maybe the Royals are starting to be a little bit quicker to pull that trigger because with Hochaver, you know, he's been here for four years now, five years he's been in the majors. I'm not sure exactly. But, um, you know, since he was so young when he first started, I feel like they haven't really hung on to him quite as long as the Kyle Davies thing. So maybe they'll, you know – maybe with as, as pressure mounts to be good, they'll start pulling the trigger on these quicker and quicker. And if that's what this is kind of a sign of things to come, then then I'll take that even though I don't really know that I care that Volstead's a royal now. Yeah, he's, well, he's not good, but he's younger than Hochaver. He's going to cost less towards payroll than Hochaver. Um, his numbers look better than Luke Hochaver. Uh, doesn't mean he's any good. He's just not Luke Hochaver. Um, the, on, on its own, it's not it's like, terrible. It's, it's like just, Brady Quinn over Matt Castle. It's like yeah. Brady Quinn's not good either, but he's just not Matt Castle. He's so. not Matt Castle, yeah. And it's like, okay, just on the surface, it's not an awful move. It's just not good, and it's not anything to be excited about. So. And, and actually, if I may jump in, the, the worst part, it, it, it doesn't become awful – until the Royals try and cram it down our throats like that was one of their moves of signing a big free agent. Mm-hmm. That's where the rage comes from. <laughs> because right after they did this, date, some of Dayton Moore's comments, I, it's just more of the same stuff. Uh, you know, the, This is what he's told Bob Dutton. He said about Volstead, he's had a lot of ups and downs, but he's still very young. Our scouts have seen him, and his stuff is still good. Hopefully we can get him back on track. Okay, back on track to, uh, you know, just under league average. That's what we're shooting for with this guy. Um, you know, and then he, there's more about Dayton Moore and his approach this off season, And they've kind of shifted away from this idea of going out and trying to sign guys to where now maybe we're going to try to do uh, these reclamation projects. And you just can't do that. It's just not, it's not going to work. You know, you can't keep taking guys and gambling on them just because you think you can turn them around. I mean, this is an organization. They, they've been touted as the best farm system in baseball. They've got guys from 2007 to 2008 draft, all these pitching guys, you know, Mike Montgomery and Danny Duffy and all these great guys. The only three guys who have made a start that have been drafted by Dayton Moore, I think, are Danny Duffy, um, Everett Tiford. And uh, there's one more, and I he well, made one takes, start. And it's like, that. th- that's that's it. I mean, that's all you get out of it. Uh, I think Dusty Hughes is the third one. So if those are all the pitchers that you can develop, how are you going to turn guys around? That's, how are you going to break bad habits when you can't even develop somebody from scratch? I, I was going to make that 
I was going to make that exact same point, Mike. It's just it's befuddling how you can say you have absolutely no evidence to say that you've done anything good with developing or fostering good pitching, and yet here you are trying to say we can make this guy better, we can make it work. What? It's just, it's just not going to work. And uh, you know, I know it's going to be tough in free agency, but it almost sounds like Dayton Moore has given up. Like he's already got his excuse lined up that they can't compete, and they can't. You know, uh, Anabel Sanchez is going to be about $60 million, and that's a lot. But over four years, if you get a guy who's – he's 29 now. You know, he's a guy who can get you 200 innings, and he's going to be a number two level starter on most teams. And, and you know that's what? perfectly fine. And you know what? I, I don't want to hear this crap about the Royals can't afford it because they can't. Exactly. Yeah. They can. You know, the Royals can go – Eighty, eighty-five million dollars in payroll. Absolutely. And they were at about sixty-three or sixty-four this year. Yeah. So I mean, sign Anibal Sanchez and get you. You know, that's fifteen million right there. And you know, sign another pitcher that maybe is a another reclamation project, but not quite as big a one as like a Volstad, and you know, make him a little bit cheaper. I mean, you can. They've got. You know. For, for players that could be elite, like Eric Hosmer, Mike Moustakas, Salvador Perez, my God, Al Alcides Escobar, those guys are dirt cheap, and they're all yeah. players that could be next year, could be top five at their position. So, I mean, the Royals are saving a lot of money right now on that. They need to put it somewhere. Mm -hmm. they, can, they can't afford it. They just It's whether or not they choose to. And part of what they've uh -huh. talked about is they don't want to block prospects, and they gave us the same thing last year when you know Mark Burley was on the market and C.J. Wilson was out there, and you know Roy Oswald, even though he you know sucked, yeah, he looked like a guy that the Royals could have, should have signed, and all these different players, and they said they didn't want to sign anybody because they didn't want to block the guys that they had coming up, and uh, all that got was uh, you know a Jake Odorizzi for two starts in the last week and a half of September. That's who you blocked all year. And, and, and Mike Montgomery going back down to double A. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's maddening. Dayton Moore is either too afraid to demand that they can spend the money, or he's just incompetent to know who to locate that they need to sign. And both of those are fireable offenses. And I've been on his, I've been on his, on his side for so long, and I just can't do it anymore. I can't defend what he does anymore because. He's completely incompetent in his job at this point. He can't put together a major league roster. He can't approach how to develop players. He doesn't open himself to new ideas or doing things differently when this team has been awful for 20 years. Uh, something has to change, and they're not willing to change anything. It's, I, it's disturbing. I, I couldn't have said it better, Mike. And, I mean, you know, as, as an accountant, we did, like, a lot of – in school – in accounting, we did a lot of, of you know, obvious, obviously case studies on different businesses and different things like that. And it's so weird, the dichotomy between, you know, people always say, oh, well, professional sports is a business, but it operates so differently than a true business does. But, you know, to try and make the best example possible, I mean, you know, look at the auto industry in America, you know, like Ford and Chrysler and all them. I mean, say Ford comes over and says, oh, well, we're going to go buy, um, well, they already own Aston Martin, but say they, uh, you know, when they first bought them, they're like, oh, we're going to go buy Aston Martin, and we're going to turn them into even better car company. It's like, well, Ford has sucked for the last 50 years as a car company. What makes you think that they could buy another car company and turn it into a good one? You know, it's the same kind of kind of thinking that, that, that the Royals have. It's like they have not done anything to make us think that they can competently run an organization. Yet they keep trying to get us to believe that that they're going to do things better than other organizations did, but they've been doing it worse for years and years and years. And they, their refusal to, just like like you said, Mike, just to not think it gets so maddening when they can't think outside the box. It just has to be this rigid, you know, this is the way that we've done it, and this is the way it's going to work, and it just it's just not. I mean, you you know. Talk about blocking pitchers and yeah. and blocking prospects. Never, never, ever worry about that. Ever. I mean, yeah. if you can get a quality player on That's your team, that's a good problem then, to have. Then do it. You know, don't ever worry about that because exactly, yeah. If you have seven pitchers 
who could be starters at the major league level, then thank God. I mean, who cares if two of them are blocked? Freaking trade them. That's what the Rangers did. Why do you think they yeah. made the World Series? They went out and they had so many starting pitchers in 2011, they traded two legitimate prospects for a reliever just to help them make a run. I mean, if you if you are in that case, in that situation where you have I mean, look at the Rays. I mean, they yeah. every year, every offseason. There's a new off- rookie who comes in in September yeah. and gives them five starts to help them in the playoff run. And, look at and, and, and every year they have, they talk in the offseason like, oh, who are the Rays going to trade? Is it going to be James Shield? Is it going to be Neiman? Is it going to be Cobb? Who are they going to trade? And I mean, they haven't really pulled the trigger a lot in the past couple of years, but ultimately those options are what makes things great. Sorry, Joe, and, I didn't interrupt. No, that's fine. I, I actually interrupted you. Um, I was just going to say on that note, look what the A's did. They traded everybody, it seemed. They yeah. seemed to be dead in the water, and all of a sudden they came back to life and, and, and won the hardest division in baseball behind the AL East and and made the playoffs and, and just, it, I mean, blows your mind. I mean, Oakland, the Athletics are in the playoffs. Were, the <laughs> Orioles are in the playoffs. Yeah, the Here A's we are. were intentionally rebuilding. Like, they didn't expect to win, and they still won. It's ridiculous. I uh, literally... The- I remember in May when um, this Tommy Malone guy comes up and just shuts down the Royals, yeah. and everyone's like, who the hell is this guy? And it's like, oh, well, that's who they got. And I, was that the Gio Gonzalez trade? This is the Gio right? Gonzalez. Yeah. yeah, he was that's a natural. That's they got the Gio Gonzalez trade, and it's like, oh, that's weird. And then all of a sudden he comes out to be one of the that best rookie work. pitchers in the American League. And yeah. it's like, yeah, they, they traded Trevor Cahill. They traded Gio Gonzalez, who are pitchers that they drafted and they developed. Mm-hmm. They're going to more prospects, and now they have even better pitchers, and they have more of them. I mean, it, it's, it's insane. And that's a – that's them turning, you know, a quote unquote problem. And they didn't even have a problem because it's not like they had too many pitchers. They had just they had just enough. But they turned that situation into something that was even better for them. And it's because Billy Bean is forward thinking and he thinks outside the box. And Dayton Moore doesn't do that. You know, he won't even he won't even trade a closer that he had for five years that on a losing team that now we're gonna pay theoretically could pay eight million dollars to next year coming off his second Tommy John. I mean. It's things like that that make – and a track record of it that make Dayton more yeah. famous. So, so. Yeah, one thing on its own, not that big a deal, but when it's every year, there's five to ten examples. The best comment I saw on Twitter about this blocking prospects thing uh, came from Jeff Parker. And uh, he said, it's funny because the Royals didn't have any trouble blocking Will Myers all year. That's a good point. I'm going to say, it's just like if you're going to say one thing, stick to it. You know, don't don't do this double speak, and it's just uh, it, it's really frustrating because it's my team, it's a team I've watched since I was eight years old. I'm not going anywhere, but by God, it makes it, they make it as difficult as possible to to be a fan, and you know, uh, it just sucks. And what's disgusting is is I feel bad for you guys that were were born into Royals fandom because <laughs> we coming didn't have from a the choice. <laughs> right coming from Nebraska I had a choice this is how bad I I am at life I made the wrong choice you know I had a choice I could have chose the Braves because they were on TBS I could have chose the, the Cubs because they were on WGN I could have chose the Cardinals because they were considered one of the home teams and I chose the Royals and so you know it's. It, we're here. We're stuck with it, and I want to move on because we're already almost a half hour in or so. And Jeff on wanted our short to do, show. <laughs> yeah, and I've got forty minutes worth of interviews, and I really don't want this to be a two-hour show. And All we've right. got a whole other segment yet, but we can talk about this more next week because um, we're going to effort next week to have Mike get us um, a gentleman from the Twins for Fan Sided because he wrote a great article about who the Twins need to look at for pitching. They're in the same boat we are. And then Mike also a little programming. Uh, live live planning here for you folks. Try to get a hold of one of the fan sided guys for the Orioles. I want to talk, or not the Orioles for the uh, for the A's. I want to talk about okay. last year with them and we'll see go. and and get kind of the opinion from from inside the the uh, velvet rope of, of the Oakland Athletics. Um, <laughs> and especially play. with San Francisco being in the playoffs and everything. I mean, just the Bay Area having such a huge huge year this year. Um, and that just Both to Bay to areas. that, I, I think. I think there'll be a, a good thing I wanted to bring up today, but we're not going to have time, so we can do it next week. But there was a tweet I had that I that I favorited um, that I was going to tweet out. It was talking about no matter who wins this World Series, Moneyball loses, and they talk about how 
it's because like neither of the teams like walk or, or you know I mean not not quite that but 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 it seems to be like a we are just kind of continually misunderstanding the whole money ball thing but anyway it's something that uh, we can talk about next week but that'll be something to look forward to and an interesting topic of of still how that money ball debate rages even though it's it shouldn't be it's still completely misunderstood even though it shouldn't it's be 10 years after the fact completely all the time yeah yeah but anyway that's for next week folks so um on that note uh jeff make sure we get that written down so we, we remember to to cover that awesome. I, don't, I don't plan around it um but you know the thing is and i, I want to do a couple of things real quick here before we go to break then we're going to come back uh, do our out of the park baseball segment, um, out of the park developments.com. We're going to do that segment, and then we got the interviews at the end. 40 minutes worth of interviews with Jason Adam and uh, Ryan Verdugo. Uh, but I did want to say that we're, we're going to, you kind of got an idea of what we're going to do for the next couple weeks. We do have, we will at some point do a show with Jason Parks this offseason. I swear to you on that. We're just trying to time it for a week when we don't have a lot going on. Uh, but the, if the Royals continue to make some of these idiotic moves, um, we're gonna we're gonna have plenty to talk about, but we will have Jason Parks at some point. Um, and just on one last note on this, I I read that when I was calling volleyball live for Park University, and I had to close it. I had to close the article because the quotes from Dayton Moore just make you want to punch somebody, and and it's hard to stay focused on what you're doing. And I'm getting paid by Park University to call their volleyball games, and and they deserve a hundred percent of you my don't attention. Really... Not yeah. You don't really Not, need expletives going out. Bump set. Well, and, and the funny thing is, a little off topic, and then we'll go to break, but I found out yesterday when I was interviewing the coach before the game, I found out they go back and watch the videos that I do, and they listen to what I say, because he was actually laughing about me saying about how he was going on a tirade or something with one of the referees. So I didn't realize they went back and watched them. I just kind of do my own thing and, and didn't really care, you know, but – I, I guess I got to pay a little better attention because it's not just the families that are watching; it's the actual team. Um, on that note, let's go to break. We'll come back talk about out of the park baseball. We'll take another break and then we'll have a couple of interviews for you. We'll be right back on the other side. And if you're watching live, welcome into the Michael Ingle show. Something is screwy with my recording computer, and I can't reach it from here, so um, it's all Michael Ingle all the time. Uh, the rest it's of us. Not, it's not on mine. It switches on mine. Does it? Okay, so maybe yeah. it's maybe everything's just screwy on my end. So if it's switching now, then that's perfect. Otherwise, it was just a Michael Engel show. But of course, the gentleman you just heard from was Jeff. Her. I don't think we actually um, said anything to Jeff in the beginning because we got to talking about Mike up on the screen. But um, uh, you know, guys, we uh, we've had a little bit of fun this last month. We we entered into an, a, um, a deal with um, Out of the Park Baseball, which provided us a couple of of their games that are normally $40 a piece. If you get them before the Giants win the World Series, then um, then you can get it for 20 bucks. I shouldn't say that because the way the playoffs have went this year with the Cardinals having their huge yeah, comeback you can't and, then, anybody out. and then blowing it the way the Rangers did and, and blowing it to the Giants, and, and now the Giants have won like six straight elimination games. So who knows? Maybe the Tigers fire back and, and we have a real long World Series. But – Part of what we did was we were going to see if we could save the Royals. And I don't know if the programming in the game, because the Royals have been bad for so long, kind of plays into that. But I never could get the team to the to the playoffs. Uh, Mike did it the first season. Mm -hmm. I was able to get some right around 500 teams. But I even went out the last season and just I, – I, I had sold off a bunch of pieces and then signed a whole bunch of pitching, thought I finally had the team, and – and it didn't pan out. Um, how did how did you guys end up doing? And that mine was through like 2015, 2016. How did Mike? How did you end up doing on yours? Uh, I got through 2014. Uh, I finished that season the other day, and uh, the last season was really bad. I finished like 64 and 98 something. It was just really terrible. I think uh, the team went about seven and 20 in May, and then went about four and 22 in July. Like, it was just every, like, I go day by day, you can advance it to the next day. And I would just look, and so, another loss, another loss, another loss. I think they went on two or three different eight-game losing streaks. And, uh, you know, this is a team I had Jeremy Guthrie, I had Cole Hamels, I had Annabelle Sanchez. You know, uh, Danny Duffy was pitching really well. Uh, Chris Medlin was one of the starters that I had. And it just, they, it, 
it was one of those things where on a day where the the offense would score six runs, they'd give up seven. And on the other, the flip side, you know, even if they only give up two runs, you know, the offense scores zero. So I'm at the point where um, it's just been rough. Um, our top prospect in the system is DeAndre Tony, who in real life was traded to the Astros as part of the Quintero trade. But uh, I called him up in September of 2014, and he hit five homers in September. It was cool. Um, let's hope that's not reality. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Declined Billy Butler's option at the end of 2014 because he was hitting uh, from the the three seasons that I played. He hit about a total of two hundred of two sixty and like thirty five homers. So just completely not the Billy Butler. I've that's the now. future right there. Thirty five home runs, two sixty. I bet you money that that is no, the that's future over of Billy three Butler. Seasons. That's combined. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> I think he's going to take his option. Because I think it he's going to hit a few more home runs. Yeah, it would have been $13 million for that. Um, I think he's going to do better in real life. Um, I think the 260 isn't too far off, though. 260, 275, 30, 35 home runs. Not for Butler. Not not Butler. I think if they change these guys and have them hit home runs, man, I think it's going to screw them they did up. That, they did that this year, though, and look at what Butler did. Now, others, that's a different story. Gordon... Yeah, I could easily see him being 260 and, and 25 homers. But uh, anyway, uh, Eric Hosmer has been playing well. He's been an all-star all three seasons I played uh, as, as the GM. And Mike Moustakis was second in the league in RBIs. So, oh, and Jeremy Guthrie won a gold glove, or a great glove, as right. they call it. Um, yeah, but that's about it. Uh, David Glass did pass away in mine. Um, did Josh Glass take over for no, you too? No, his, his son Jack Glass <laughs> actually did. Um, I had to fire Ned Yost, so I I actually hired um, Ruben Amaro as the manager. I had Clint Hurdle at mine on the end. And then and then my uh, scouting director Lonnie Goldberg left, so I hired Jeff Lunau for that, which is pretty cool. Uh, I like that. That was pretty neat. Considering he's the GM now. Yeah, Jay Bell is my hitting coach now. Um, yeah, I mean, just a lot of different changes. I've got to go in and hire all my minor league guys now, too. I actually wouldn't mind that in real life if Jay Bell was the hitting coach. I like Jay Bell. Jay Bell is one of my, like, three favorite shortstop of all time in the Royals organization. And he's so, like a season and a half. <laughs> That's what's that say? <laughs> there you go. Well, you know, some of the best managers aren't good players. I mean, Tony Ruiz and, and Joe Torre were okay baseball players, but they – yeah put together quite the careers as managers and, and baseball professionals. Well, uh, that's that's across all sports, I think. I've, I've always had a theory on that where, I mean, what do they say? Those who can't do, teach, right? But, right. Um, the, I mean, every great football coach, basketball, I mean, Bill Self was, was an okay player. You know, you look at, uh, like, Bill Belichick, I don't even know if he played in the NFL. I don't think uh, Marty did. Schottenheimer was not a great NFL player. Um, I mean, occasionally you get someone like a Mike Ditka, who's a Hall of Famer as in the as a player and a coach. But, but yeah, typically those those players that are just kind of average or worse are the ones that make the better coaches. They learn enough themselves on how to get to that point, and then they can later communicate it. Whereas, how is King Griffey Jr. going to teach somebody how to hit like King Griffey Jr.? Oh, you just swing. Yeah, oh, it's, okay. it's, it's, why Michael, it's why Michael Jordan's never going to make a good coach. Oh yeah. How do you make all those shots? Oh, I just make them. Oh, I don't know. thanks. Cool. How'd you make that throw, Brett Favre? Oh, I don't know. I just threw it. That's what it is. I mean, it, it, yeah. And that kind of goes back to our, our hitting coach uh, discussion. You know, those guys weren't ever very good, so maybe they can uh, teach something. Charlie Lau was not a very good player or a good hitter at the big league level, but uh, he was able to teach some good hitters. So, you know, we'll see. But anyway. Uh, how did your season go, Jeff? Um, I gotta be honest. I've been busy lately. We're trying to to get our house ready to sell, so I'm still in my first season. But it's not great. It's not great. I'm 27 and 39 right now, so I'm actually doing a better job of being the Royals than the Royals are. So, <laughs> if, if that if, if that tells you anything, I'm eight and a half games back. Um, Eric Hosmer is killing it. 323, eight home runs, 43 RBIs. Um, Alcides Escobar is actually having a season basically like he actually had. He's hitting like 292 with no home runs or, you know, maybe one or two home runs and stuff. So uh, Mike Montgomery, 
4.5 ERA, which isn't terrible, but isn't great, but leaves my team in wins and 83 strikeouts through um, 66 games. So um, this game seems to really like Mike Montgomery because I'm pretty sure he had some success in your guys' your guys' He did until he got – well. So until he injured his shoulder and had to retire. <laughs> yeah, and, and literally when uh, I fired this back up and, and started doing it, and, and Danny Duffy just had an injury, and I'm waiting on the prognosis, which means Tommy John, so he's probably gone yeah. for uh, – for the rest of the year. So my injury, my injury, uh, my IR is pretty bad right now, or DL, I should say. But uh, I'm going to, um, hopefully things will slow down for me. I'll get some more time to, to put into this game because I, I do enjoy playing it, even though I'll start cursing at my computer and my girlfriend will be like, what's going on? I'm like, stupid Royals. She's like, I thought the season was over. Like, no, no, I have not record baseball now, so... Yeah, she's probably really fond of me right about this minute. I got you into this podcast, and I got you this game, and, and uh, she's got to about hate me, I suppose. Um, you know, the the cool thing about this game, and I, I was a little tentative with, with doing it this way because I hate to do a show where where we are so market where we're so tied to, to marketable elements and what have you, but again, we want to be able to produce a show for you the way we want it, and and this has allowed us um, a little bit to to talk about things in a different way. And and some of the feedback I've got has been real positive. I know Jeff Parker, as you mentioned, he uh, he's a listener and, and a friend of the program, and now a writer for KOK. He uh, he mentioned you know he got a good kick out of out of this segment as a whole, but but a whole big kick out of uh, Josh Glass taking over from my team. I can I can only imagine what he what he's going to think when he finds out that Jack Glass. The other unknown son How many? has a team now too. So I want I want this backstory too. I want to know if like it's a rainy night and uh, there's a knock at the glass door and uh, you know this long lost son is standing there dripping wet and there's thunder and lightning. Yeah. And the glass say, family door is what you're saying. It's not actually right, a door made right. of glass. I, I hope it's made out of glass. But <laughs> they open it and the butler and you know David Glass had a butler. You know it. Of course. Uh, He's probably got it. one in his press box. Right, and is standing there aghast at Jack Glass returning for what is his. Well, him and his twin brother, Josh. I mean, Josh. He, he had abandoned <laughs> these twins somewhere, and, and they're back. But, you know, and we do. I'd we be love... worried about Dan Glass. Yeah, there you go. Cause, no, I He's not in say. a ditch well, somewhere in this it's, situation. It's like, a, <laughs> it's, it's like the Hunts with the Chiefs. Um, the uh, Clark is not the oldest Hunt. There's, uh, I can't remember what the name he might actually be Lamar Hunt Jr. is older, and occasionally he'll have some some video or something on the jumbotron, and I'll show it up there, or they'll show it up there at the Chiefs games. And I lean over to my dad and I make some comment calling him the the Fredo of the Hunt family because he got passed over for the for the ownership <laughs> of the Chiefs, and it went to Clark instead of the oldest. Because um, I think uh, I mean I think he didn't go to like as prestigious of a school as Clark and all that kind of stuff. That's funny. I poked fun like that. I wanted it. I'm <laughs> smart. Yeah, I'm apparently there, <laughs> there's got to be some reason for it, but uh, who knows? But um, I do want to I do want to thank everybody that does give us feedback on the show. Um, we I try to mention everybody. I know that that a lot of people are are unhappy that we went away from the live show at the chat room, and he ain't really. And Dave Darby and and uh, Heather, uh, I don't know what she's changed her her handle to lately. I think it's. Uh, little little Duff's mom or something and whatever it happens to be you know Heather um, she's been a great friend of the program you know they missed the live show and, and but some people have, have embraced the YouTube and I know a, a friend of ours from Vancouver Washington who's watching right now a Casey Royals fanatic he's always been real good about giving us feedback David Lowe who's a big fan of this show and uh, the Pine Tar Press show has always given us good feedback and, and helped us to guide the show and we really do listen guys so if you have if you got something that's going on you know royalmanreport at gmail.com we'll read your emails on the air we, we take we truly do take everything you guys say to heart and and we go with it from there so if you like this segment and it's something you want us to continue after this week let us know because otherwise our agreement with out of the park is over but I think it was a good segment I really do I um, yeah, of fun. course it, it had a marketing deal behind it but it was fun and it was something different and I have started uh, a Royals um, franchise now in 1969 this is another option you can do you can go back in time and relive history uh, Greg another good friend of the program uh, his handle is G R O G G. he uh, he loves to make um, fake leaks 
And he says, that's where the most fun is. Just create your own league and, and run with it there. And I haven't had time to do that yet. Yeah, and, but it, and his, his point to all that is because with fake names and fake teams, you don't have that, in, you know, that instilled level of attachment. Like, yeah. for me, Mike Montgomery, I want him to succeed and out of the park because he, he so far hasn't in real life. But if you take that out of the equation, then it's legitimately just trying to put the best players so you don't have – so there is, there is some legitimacy to, to having a completely fictional league. Um, and, yeah, so that, that's really neat. And in 1969, I did get through my first season. I'm working on my second right now. Uh, it's hard. I'll tell you, if you go back and do some of the historical leagues when there was only two teams making the playoffs from each league, that is some hard baseball. Uh, in, in my 1969, I made a lot of trades, and it's easy because you know who's going to be good. Uh, so I, I used some players that were projected to maybe be good but didn't turn out, and I traded for, like, Willie Stargell, who was the team MVP. <laughs> And he's still the continual all-star, the one all-star for the Royals, mind you. I still Royals still only get one all-star, even in 1969. Um, and we went to the playoffs, lost to the 108-win Baltimore Orioles, who went on to the World Series to get beat by the 100-win Cubs. In four, they got beat four to two in the World Series. Cubs winning it all. Royals got done three to two in uh, in the playoffs. So I'm in 1970, and we're 516 games out of first place. I think behind the Tigers. At 500, so crazy. It, it's gonna it's gonna be a it's gonna be a rough run. And my owner is hot, who is not Kaufman, by the way. Um, it's somebody altogether different, and he's really hot because um, because we were supposed to make the playoffs again this year, and we're not going to. So, uh, but it's fun, you know. Go out, check it out. Um, what I want to do here is I'm gonna for those that are are listening to the podcast. This went, of course, famous last words, short oh, yeah. show. Um, way too yeah, long. Uh, it, it just ended up being a good day of talk, and that's what we do around here. And if you listen to the show, you must like listening to us talk because that's what you get. So we're going to go ahead and end the show here. I know I promised you interviews. What I will do, instead of hanging on to those like I had planned for a day when we didn't have much to talk about, I will go ahead and, and try to run a show. I'll coordinate with Mike. We'll try to um, – post a show on Kings of Kaufman about midweek. For those of you listening live, we will go ahead and talk about the interviews here on this um, feed, but you won't see the interviews because I don't have a way to feed them in. So go ahead and stay right here. We're going to be back in just a minute with those interviews, and if any time remains, we'll have a little bit of a football talk as well. Uh, I know I know the K-State Wildcats are already playing, and I do want to try to catch the second half of that game. But for Michael Engel and Jeff Herr, I'm Troy Olson. And this has been the Kansas City Baseball Vault. Uh, stay tuned for the midweek show with the interviews with Ryan Verdugo and and Jason Adam. But until next week, um, everybody have a great week. Be good to each other and go Royals. Welcome into a special edition of the Kansas City Baseball Vault. You're hearing this sometime midweek because we had promised you interviews last Saturday and the show ran too long. And, and for the sake of you not having to hear a two-hour show, we're going to split this up and make it two separate shows. And we'll, uh, we'll release these interviews sometime um, in the middle of the week. And we had, a, we had a chance to get on the phone. I should say I had a chance. We're still working out the details of, of like those guys over at the Pine Tar Press podcast who have – Skype mastered. We're still working on mastering Skype on our end. Um, and so we're going to do a real quick wraparound on these two interviews that I'm going to play. So let me set them up for you, and then and then you'll hear the interviews, and then we'll come back, and the guys and I will talk about it, and uh, and we'll go from there. It's actually just going to be Mike and I on this. Uh, Jeff, of course, part of the show, He's uh, he didn't have a chance to listen to the interviews uh, because he was pretty busy this week. They're trying to sell their house. So um, first off, uh, here's the interview with – Ryan Verdugo. And that was that was me sitting down with Ryan Verdugo, or as you can probably tell by sometimes I'm a little winded, I don't sit down when I talk on the phone. I have to walk around. So, uh, you know, I, really? I like, yeah, I, I it's, it's my ADHD, man. Blame it on the ADD. Um, anyways, so Ryan Verdugo's a really neat guy. He's been on the show a couple of times. We had a lot of fun with him. Um, gave tried to give him a Verdugo a little bit of a hard time. I did incorrectly give out his Twitter handle during the interview. It's um, teach me to Doogie 11. I thought he had gotten rid of the 11 when he came back, but it's teach me to Doogie D U G I 11. Uh, definitely follow him on Twitter. Great guy. But like, uh, like uh, DB Lesky said on our, our round table show, um, 
he he may not be with this team next year. And we kind of talked about that. Mike, what did you take away from the interview with Verdugo? You know, I, I thought that was the main thing that, that really kind of stood out was just, you know, his frankness about that situation that he knows that this is a business, that, uh, you know, his spot is not guaranteed. And, you know, even following on, twi on Twitter, I think he said something at some point um, – uh, I don't remember who he was talking to, but he said something in reference to his start last year. And he was like, well, if you go looking for my ERA, it's, it's like 500 or something. So, well, you know, he under, you know, definitely understands that, you know, his, he wasn't that great. But I, that was the thing that I took was that he's just understanding that it's, it's a tough business and it's a tough roster to make. Um, you know, and even with guys like Clinton Robinson that you guys talked about a little bit and, and, and whatnot about, you know, the possibility that some guys are just going to have to be left off. And, you know, and I, I really did enjoy his frankness. And we, he's always been that way, even on Twitter. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I can't share some of what we talked about off the air, but, you know, we even talked a little more about that and, and, and some things that, that have happened to do with his Twitter. But, you know, he did leave for a while. Mm -hmm. to be more focused and he came back and he did have that bad start and that you know that sucks for him because he is a very nice guy and you know like we it's the story of the royals nice guys you know they don't pan out but hopefully he'll be the exception and i i appreciate what he said about the fans because honestly he took it better than i did i mean i was hot 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 hot, hot about that situation and uh, i mean he even kind of scolded his sister he's like yeah she'd had a couple of drinks anyways and you know whatever so <laughs> yeah. What but are you gonna do? He he wasn't he wasn't upset at all. I mean he, he would have booed himself, he said. So I I think if there's a yeah. guy that you want to get behind, you wanna hope does better than what we first saw. And look at how bad Will Smith did and, and the notoriously famous um, rant by me on, on the Kansas City Baseball Vault radio show where I was not trying to say that he's going to be the next Nolan Ryan, but that's how all you clowns took it. <laughs> oh, that's um, how Chris did. I know exactly what you're saying. I, I was, I'm right with you on that. Okay, well, good. I'm glad it. somebody is. I understand um, what you're saying there. I just, you know, it's it's more fun to watch Chris pile on. <laughs> yeah, this is true. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, he's not going to be Nolan Ryan, but Will Smith had a good year. I mean, he, he may be a, a, a big part of this team next year, and hopefully – Ryan Verdugo gets another shot, and you know there's something to be said for not getting called up on that 40 man though. There is something there, and I didn't expect him to really tell us. But as a reporter, I ask the question, and I can only get the answers they're willing to give me. And I'm not gonna try to trick yeah. him into an answer. That's not what we're about here at the Kansas City Baseball Vault. We'll never be like that. So, um, but I think that. Did you have any other last thoughts on that interview, Mike? No, no. Okay, it's pretty cut and dry. If you haven't heard the original one, go check it out. Uh, it's it's really funny. A lot of Harry Potter talk. I'm, I we didn't have as much cleverness in this one. I think we had pretty well covered that. But I wanted to get down and dirty with the baseball. Uh, we're going to be right back right after this to talk about the Jason Adam interview. So later that that day, the same day I talked to Ryan Verdugo, I had a chance to to call up Jason Adam, who's been an absolutely amazing part of our show um he's from the kansas city area went to uh blue valley north i believe northwest, and, uh, northwest. he's he's yeah. only told me this probably eight times and i still yeah. get it wrong um <laughs> he uh he's been on with us literally what is it mike six seven times now six or seven yeah mike gives me a hard time i even mentioned this in the interview that i, I call up jason at least you know once a quarter uh, probably and yeah, just, uh, i'm always like we can talk to other people it's okay but, you know, it, it's real easy when you have somebody's number like that and you can just say, hey, you know, what, what's yeah. your opinion as a fan of what's going on in Kansas City? You know, just talk to us. And, and honestly, you know, it's like I said, if, if it was going to be a five-minute interview, it was a five-minute interview, but he's always worth talking to. Um, he's a very, very nice guy. And I, uh, I found, for me, the things that I took away from that was, as a fan, he gets it too, and he, he's really frustrated with this team. Um, I thought his uh, I thought his conversation about growing up in in a KU family and then rooting for Mizzou was quite hilarious. So. Yeah, that that was something else. <laughs> I guess I get it, but uh, he also did admit that he's a, a fair weather fan. Yeah, he he did sense. say that. So, so. I mean, he, he he openly said it, and that's okay. The first step is admitting. Right, and so he uh, he's a lot of fun in that way, and and but he's not he's really no he's a lot like you, Mike. He doesn't do anything but baseball. I mean, I took that away. He doesn't even care for college football or anything. It's it's all baseball for for Jason. So, 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, what what did you primarily is. take away from that, Mike? You know, the, 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 answer answer that, the answer that he gave to the idea of if he were traded for somebody that got the Royals over the hump was almost exactly what you want to hear from a guy. And not, not in that, like, cliched way. You know, uh, you know the way he was talking about how he wanted to be the guy that got him over the hump and not be the guy who got them the guy. You know, that speaks to competitiveness, and I think that's good. Um, you know, and he did have a really good year, and it is kind of weird that they didn't call him up to double A, but I don't think it's outrageous. Um, but I think he also knows that that's probably the next step and that he's ready for that next step. Did you almost take away some sadness in the thought of being traded away? A little bit. Um, you know, I think they always kind of have to know that at any moment, you know, they can be moved around for any at, at any time. I mean, it could happen over the next few months, just like that. Just one day they're there and no intention in moving them, and the next day, you know, the circumstance changes and somebody comes available, and that's the guy who needs to go. Um, but, you know, I think you, you look at guys like uh, – you look at Brandon Crawford of the Giants. I mean, the really cool story came out yesterday when uh, in 93, when the Giants were possibly going to be moving to St. Petersburg, they have this picture of Brandon Crawford who grew up a Giants fan, and now he's their, their starting shortstop in the World Series. And it's that kind of thing with Jason Adam, who grew up 30 minutes from, from Royals slash Kauffman Stadium and uh, you know has been a fan all his life and is now – playing for that hometown team. And I think, you know, there would be some sadness. I know that if I were a player and I were drafted by the Royals and they traded me, I would be disappointed, you know, because you want to, you know, I, it's one of those things that, like, uh, Kevin Goldstein gets on people a lot for this, where well, you'll say, oh, we need a starter. Oh, we? I'm not part of the team. But as a fan, you make that connection. And, you know, you do feel it as a bigger part of, of more than just being some random team, you know, you, you follow these guys and you get attached to them and you get invested in, in how they do. And, you know, I think it's got to be the same as a player, especially in his situation where he's drafted by the team that he grew up watching. Well, and, and we'll go and we're going to wrap this up pretty quick here, but we, uh, you know, we really do appreciate talking to Jason and, and I, I will tell you this, you will hear more from him before it's all said and done. He is, he's definitely going to be somebody that is going to be very involved with this show. Uh, one of the things he said to me off the air and it, it, it really went to heart for me. He said he really likes doing interviews with us because we don't take ourselves too seriously. He goes, you're serious enough to get your point across, but you have a lot of fun doing it. And he goes, mass media isn't like that is essentially what he said. And you know, for me, that that is right on the nose with what we have tried to accomplish with this show. We've tried to be legitimate enough to make people want to listen to us and, and enjoy what they hear, but still having enough fun that, that we're not the mass media. So I, I really like Jason, and he has um, he is going to try to do some stuff with us before the end of the year when he gets here to town. We don't want to give anything away on that, but he has <laughs> agreed to do it. If time allows nice. over Thanksgiving or Christmas, like he said, he lives in Arizona now. So he has kind of left us behind a little bit here in Kansas City. I shouldn't say that because I know he listens. Um, he's still a Kansas City here, guy, so. but but he's got he's got a uh, he's got a place in Arizona, and it, he's uh, he has invited me down if if I get down there for spring training, which I would say there's a 95 percent chance that I will be at spring training in mid to late March, and uh, and we'll we'll be visiting with Jason then as well. Um, me too, maybe I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know I'm going down there. I just don't know when. Well, try to plan for the beginning of spring training if you can, because yeah, then we can have full coverage. But right. I will say this. If anybody's ever wanted to be part of the of the Kansas City Baseball Vault or the Royal Man Report, this is your chance. If you're down in, in spring training and you can get your hands on a recorder, because all you got to do is go up to the field. They'll talk to you. Yeah. If you want to be an on-the-site reporter, we'll put you – you know, you can come on the Google Talk with us, and we'll make you part of the show for a couple of weeks. If you want to go down there, just let us know, royalmanreport at gmail.com. Let us know. Uh, but let us know who else you want to hear from. We're, we're still, we're always efforting. Um, one question or one person that I want the fans to tell me if you'd be interested to hear from this guy is, uh, he had mentioned him in the interview. So I'm going to reach out to Jason and see if we can, if we can get him as well. But Trevor Rosenthal, who's actually a Cardinals pitcher, oh, yeah. um, I, I'm going to effort to get him anyways because I'm going to. If we're not going to have him on here, I'm going to try to do an interview with Bill Ivy and run it with one of Bill's uh, shows over at I-70 Baseball. 
Um, he runs, he's got a more national scope as well with, uh, with some of his sites. Bill's got his hands on a lot of stuff, honestly. And, uh, yeah, and, and, and so we, uh, we appreciate, I guess our, 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 uh, cousin blogger, you'd say he's not part of fan site. so he's not one of our, our sister no. sites, but he's, he's definitely part of the family. Um, so, but, but let us know if you'd like to hear from Trevor Rosenthal, because I think that could be fun too. And I can reach out to Jason and at least get a hold of their agent and, and try to get it through that. We haven't had a lot of luck with agents. I know Mike got located no. through an agent, but I couldn't get Jeff Frank or through an agent. So that just, that tells you, I guess the difference in the agents, but do you have any uh, closing thoughts on any of this, Mike? No, I mean, I, I, I hope Jason Adam does well when he gets to double A. I'm pretty sure that's where he's going to end up. Um, it's good to hear that he's always working. And, uh, you know, Verdugo, too. I hope he gets another shot because, you know, why not? I mean, he's an easy guy to root for. Um, and, you know, if he pans out, then, hey, that's one less pitcher you have to wait to see if they pan out, right? And even if he only ends up being a reliever and he's, he's mm-hmm. another Aaron Crow type, is that all that bad? No, so. no. I mean... A good arm is a good arm, and, and you know we'll take them. So, uh, Jeff, do you have any comments on on Verdugo or, or Adam as a whole? Do you want to add? Um, I kind of echo Mike's sentiments uh, as far as um, Verdugo. I mean, obviously he's been on the show a couple of times, so of course it's easy for us to root for. But I think even the, the general public, if you follow him on Twitter and stuff like that, you see he's an easy guy to root for. You want him to succeed, and like Mike said, at any time. You know, the more talent you can get in pitching up to this organization that's better than what we got, then let's get it up here, you know. And, I mean, if you move Verdugo to the bullpen, I mean, our bullpen is pretty stacked, so, uh, you know, that's a little bit tougher competition. But it, the, the sentiment remains the same. And Jason Adam, I mean, the, the guy has – he's gotten better each year. Um, he continues to look more and more like a legitimate major league prospect. And hopefully – he continues that trend up towards next year. And, I mean, if he – double-A is really seems to be for Royals prospects and for a lot of prospects in general, but you notice a lot with, with the Royals just because yeah. Wilmington is such a pitcher's park and the yeah. Texas League is such an offensive league that double-A is kind of that make-or-break point. So if, if Jason Adam can come up next year and be in double-A and have some success, then all of a sudden we can start talking about him projecting towards the major leagues legitimately – you know, now he, he seems to be like he can make it, and I think he can. I just hope he continues to get better because I'd, lo- I'd love to see a good, solid guy, hometown guy like that come up and, and be a contributing member of the Royals. So I think it'd just be great. Well, and if Jason makes it to the pros and Trevor Rosenthal continues kind of the arc he's on, maybe he helps us bring a guy like that here to Kansas City because he's been outstanding. Um, Card Stick, who's Bill Ivey's wife, um, that still sounds weird too. Um, she did, she tweeted something about about how outstanding his numbers were, and I'll pull them up at some point. But I, I'm it's really good to see these Kansas City kids making it in the big leagues, just as a whole Kansas City thing. But um, I think he had a great take on the fans and everything. I think they both did. And I think right now we're hurting as a fan base so bad that it's good to hear people speak positive about us, both locally or both people that are local and not local. Um, and uh, Mike. Still no injury concerns. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, think if you, uh, I think we're out of the woods there. <laughs> if, if you don't, if you don't get that joke, go back and listen to about the first three or four interviews with Jason and and my inability to ask him anything but that. I was still I, learning, guys. I so. think he had a little bit of injury scare, but it wasn't anything serious. But Troy was very concerned, which is fine. So, Concern is okay. So on that note, we're going to get out of here. This is the second full hour of uh, the Kansas City Baseball Vault for this you this week. This is going to be a short show, too. Yeah, we managed, to get, we managed to get 15 minutes of extra on top of the interview. So that, that'll make about, after I put everything together, it'll be about 50, 55 minutes on this second show. So, All right. Uh, you'll get this. You're, you're obviously hearing it now. It obviously came at sometime midweek or, or late next week. Who knows? Maybe we'll just screw up the whole schedule and, and do something really wacky next week and, or delay a show or something. Who knows? But either way, um, for Jeff Herr and Michael Engel and all the guys at Echo Sports, I'm Troy Olson. This has been the Kansas City Baseball Vault. Thank you to Jason Adam. Thank you to Ryan Verdugo. Until next week, uh, have a great day, and go Royals. All right, let me uh, run over and turn off the, uh, the, uh, the recording computer. Cool. I'm going to say bad words. Shit, piss, cock. <laughs> Motherfucker.
<laughs> Thank God we don't have to worry about the SEC or the FC 